if you're six foot three like me and 17, 18 stone, and you like to stand up for yourself, you're gonna get into trouble, aren't you? But I wasn't bothered about fighting, I thought I'd have a fight with anybody. Wouldn't lose a draw, I'm out there. Shirt off, done and dusted. You know, what can you get? <laughs> a few cuts and bruises, maybe on toothpaste, sprained noses and all. Man got cheeky to me, he was getting it. Right hand, straight on the tash. He was born with his fists up, and that glint in his eye always knew he was going to be somewhat special. He was born to fight all right. The ones who's got Fury DNA, not shy of a fight. <laughs> How's that? Fury is, you know, fighting. It's fighting anything in life. Bare knuckle fighting in professional boxing, it's still a fight game, and it runs deep in our veins. You know, I don't think there's many Furies who want to have a fight. So it must be in the DNA, mustn't it? Got to be. When did you realise, John, that you and your brothers were fighting me? Well, we used to watch my dad take a lot of stick, you know. He talked about a lot of stuff and I thought, you know what, he should be hitting. He's cheeky, you know, there's no need to treat people like that. And I'd be somewhat like 12, 13, but as a big lad, I thought, come my way and I'm going to have a go. And he used to look at us, my dad, and shake his head. And he was, he was always putting the brakes on us, my dad. But when I got to about 15 or 16, there's no breaks for me. I seen enough of it. I thought, anybody cheeks my father again, or any member of my family, we're at it. And that's how it went from there. And did that happen, John? Yeah. Yeah, it happened. But when people get to know what you're like and they know you're an handful, it doesn't happen as often, you know? And that's what it's about, standing in your corner. It's a traveller thing. If he's got anything about him at all, he's a man, he's got a family, he's got to be the head of his family. Whether he can fight or not, he'll pick he'll stand up to the plate and have it. In the last 25 years or 30 years, every single traveller site I've been to, to talk some, to some of the great gypsy boxers, when I'm sitting with them in their vans or in their settled homes, you'll invariably see seven, eight and nine and 10 year olds with gloves on. You might not see a swing, but you'll see a kid with pads on. You might not see a bike, but you'll see someone taking someone on the pads. They're a competitive group of boxers. And I think that comes across. And that's why I think that traveler boxers are just made for this sport. Boxing and fighting has been in our family for hundreds of years. So it's uh, when you cross them and cross them and cross them, this is what you end up with. The superhuman bionic boxer. Is that important to you, John? Is that fighting yeah. gypsy inheritance? Yeah, because they had to do it to survive. And I remember my mum telling me stories how disformed they was, their features, their arms, because they was fighting two or three times a week then to put food on the table and for buttons. They fought in the early 1800s on the streets of London for a living, for food, survival fighting. So the difference in between fighting to survive and fighting for lucrative stuff these men was fighting to feed the children, keep them alive with food, keep them sheltered. And that's what's in me. For there came three gypsies singing as they come. One so loud and the other so low. Till he won the heart of the lady. There was a time 30 or so years ago, and you know, you casually heard, Oi, Gippo! Pikey! Kill the Pikey! Kill the Gippo! That was standard 30 years ago. Things have changed. We've changed. Society's changed. And I'd like to think that boxing has led the way. That was 30 odd years ago. Was there more prejudice to travellers than there is now? It's uh, a lot better now because I remember the, the, the sneers and jeers going to the ring, kill the gypsy bastard, 
and all this. Uh, Jippo, this Jippo, that, that's all you got when you're going to the ring, you know. But, and, uh, but that lit the fire in me, basically, and I thought, you know what, yeah, I'll show you what this Jippo can do, I'm not going over easy. But when you put up a good fight and won, your phone never rung anymore then, because winning would cost you money, believe it or not. You only wanted to employ losers back in the day. But because I kept winning, people say, hang on a minute, he'll beat a prospect. If he comes in on our form, he's going to turn this prospect into a loser. So my phone stopped ringing. In the end, I was boxing once a year, once every 18 months, my phone would ring when they thought I was out of shape and I couldn't win anyway. So I just thought, you know what, I'll keep in decent shape. I'll do a bit of running, a bit of bag work at the back of the house. If the phone rings, I get in and do it. That's what I did. Just go back, John, to, 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 to your pro fighting days. Um, and at that point, you know, so there was, you know, there was a, 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 de a fair amount of prejudice and it was open prejudice, i.e. no gypsies allowed or even signs outside pubs. I've seen them, I've seen yeah. them reproduced now. No pikeys allowed. That, yeah. So so you got an insult and you got a bar. <laughs> how, how did you react to that? I never went to places like that because you knew the problem. If you went to places like that and you knew you were a traveller, you wouldn't get civility. So I kept away from them places. I lived a, a life where it was sort of like everything was conducted at home and because you knew the prejudice was there, public houses, clubs and this, that and the other. And I didn't want to embarrass myself or the family. So I kept away from them places. It's interesting talking to Gypsy John when he admits that what he had to put up with was not as much as his father had to put up with. But what Tyson Fury has to put up with is nothing compared to what Gypsy John had to go through. That level of hardship, this generation don't really have it. And that's in some ways why John admits he lives in the past. Hey, he says, it's hard for me not to live in the past. He remembers those days when it was hard to be not just a gypsy fighter, but to be a traveler inside British society. Now, I want to ask you about Tyson's birth. Yeah. Because it was extremely traumatic. It was. Talk me through that potentially horrible period. It was August time. You know, I was at work in the daytime and the, uh, the baby wasn't due for weeks, six or seven weeks. So anyway, I got the call. She's having the baby, I thought, strange. You know, and uh, there had been a lot of bad luck with kids in the previous pregnancies and whatnot, you know, and I thought, you know what, here we go again. But anyway, I dropped what I was doing, went to the hospital. He'd been born, but he was a pound in weight, you know, because he was, he was very premature and they said he probably wouldn't make it. But when I went, I expected the worst anyway. I prepared for that. And um, I got there and I just seen something what the doctors never. You know, I seen him, he was bright eyed. He was only very small and tiny, but he had a glint in his eye and he had his fist up like that. And I got this warm feeling, you know, something, a feeling I'd never had in my life. And something come over me, like a bright, happy feeling, what I'd never witnessed. And I'd like it, it's never happened before or after that time when Tyson was born. I looked at him and I said to the doctor, he's gonna live, he won't only live. He'll be nearly seven feet tall, 20 stone, the next heavyweight champion of the world. And the rest is history. What a prediction, eh? <laughs> what age does Tyson decide that he's actually gonna go to an amateur boxing club and he's gonna start training and that he's gonna be an amateur fighter? How did that happen, John? He started to want to come to the gyms more. He found a little amateur gym in Withenshaw, Jimmy Egan's Academy. He used to walk there, three mile there, three mile back, you know, in all weathers. And I got a call from Steve Egan himself, the old fella. Jimmy, they called him, he's come and have a look at you, lad. I said, I haven't got time. I said, I've gone busy putting food on the table. I said, Jimmy, no, you need to come and have a look, he said. This kid is going to be the next heavyweight champion of the world. And when I went and watched him spar as a kid, 13, 14, I seen this immense potential in a kid because that 14 year old he said look daddy so I've seen your trainers I can beat you now I said yeah get the gloves on so you've been cheeky get the gloves on no problem you know the skill of the boy was un uncanny you know he could punch hard fast accurate you know and I think he he jabbed me to hit me with a, uh, he hit me with a right up round the ribs and that was me done I'd had 13 fights, been in with the best in Britain and Europe and some world-class men, and never got any broke bones, never even got a cut eye. But a 14-year-old boy has jabbed me to the head and hit me with a right hook around the side and broke all my ribs. So I knew then that he was a world champion in the making. And my brother-in-law, he was stood there, Frank Burton, he said, I know how good you are. He said, now brave, a strong man you are. He said, I've always respected you. 
But your son, he said, another level. Watch this space. It's Frank Burton Isaiah's father. Yeah, uncle. Un uncle, yeah. Uncle, yeah. You know, and they're all boxers herself. Othi Burton, their grandfather. Never lost a fight. He's only middleweight and he's fighting heavyweights. He's only 11 stone seven. He fought all comers and goers right through his life. Heavyweights, all sizes. Thin uns, fat uns, tall and short uns. Everybody with a boxing reputation, Ophi Burton beat them. So there's a Burton um, inheritance and yeah. there's a Fury inheritance. Well, he had two. There was two great men on his mother's side. One was Ophi Burton, his granddad. The other one was Big Just, Ophi Burton's brother. Both kings of the day. You know, and on my side, we had my uncle Ticker, you know, never lost a fight in his life outside, lost a few in the ring, he was a journeyman fighter, but had plenty of contests, but never was beat outside. Bartley Gorman never got beat outside in his life, never lost a fight. Bartley was one of those breakthrough bare-knuckle fighters, the king of the gypsies. He was a good boxer, he knew what he was doing. He was smart, he was clever, and he was tough. And it's beautiful listening to John talk about him. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's mesmerizing. You see John's eyes kind of glaze over with that respect that he has for Bartley Gorman. He was a fighting machine and he'd do things all the fighting men wouldn't do. You know, and I can't remember him losing a fight, but he was technically raving mad because he didn't know when to stop. And he's the only man I know what a fight 20 or 30 men was all tooled up. Iron bars, hammers, bottles. And he did all that in 1976, St. Ledger Day. Well, it nearly cost him his life. He was in hospital about four months, lost every pint of blood in his body. And I remember that, because I was 11 years old and he kept running up and down, jumping about. When he seen all them men, and all you could hear, you're striding up and down, moment of truth, he kept saying, moment of truth. And with that, he just waded straight into all of them, him and his brother Sam. He just couldn't mention the F word, fighting, at all, because he wouldn't stop. And time he got to where he was going, He'd be all revved up, raring to go, and he'd sort of like be looking for trouble. You know, he'd start singing. There'd be a few certain songs he'd sing, and you know for a fact he was looking around for somebody to have a fight with. <laughs> that was just him. But at the end, John, not long past 50, it was very serious. And I know was, that you, yeah. were, you were quite involved with the last, yeah. the last couple of weeks of Bartley's mm, life. Tell me yeah. about that, John. He said, I'm at the end of my life. He said, I've got cancer. He said, I don't think it's curable. He said, I've had it too long. I've been ignoring it now for 12 months. But he said, I've got it. When we, we, we got him to the hospital and they x-rayed his body, the words from the doctor was, what has this man been doing throughout his life? You know, because he looks like he's been dragged down the road with a 20-ton dump truck. He said, every bone in his body's been broke. There's not one part of his body that's not injured. And uh, I said, he's been a prize fighter, a bare-knuckle prize fighter. He said, I have never witnessed as many injuries on one body in my life. It's in the, obviously, it's gone to cancer. These injuries has caused the cancer. And he explained it to Bartley. Well, he said, that was a profession I chose. I loved it every minute of it. So I'm 57 anyway. <laughs> and he smiled and laughed. You know, he wasn't bothered about dying. Brave man. Faced death like a man. As did my own father, because he died a week apart. My father died on the 10th of January, 2002, and he died on the 18th. And they was talking to one another on the telephone days before they died. You know, so two brave men and two cousins. How do you recover from that? Two main figures in your life's gone. One's your father and one's somebody you looked up to. There'll never be another Bartley Gorman. There'll never be another Yui Fury. Can I have a minute? I know they see the world through our eyes and all that, but I can't get that, you know, because I'm a believer. I think when you're dead, you're dead, that's it. You cease to function, you know, and I shouldn't do because I believe in God wholeheartedly. You know, I do, I've been brought up that way. But I think when your eyes are closed, that's it. The dead know nothing, do they? Nobody's ever been back to tell me anything. And my father, going back to him, he said to me, if there's any way of getting back and contacting you, lad, I will do. You know what, it's been 20 years, nothing. And I know if my dad could get back, he would. Maybe he can't, but I don't know. They say, oh, I've seen me dad, I've seen a vision. I've heard him, I've felt him, I've smelt him. I've smelt nothing, seen nothing, heard nothing. Zilch, still waiting. Maybe it's gonna happen, I don't know. Not happen yet. I'm still waiting. So if you can hear this, dad, 
contact me. <laughs> yeah. John, who was involved in um, Tyson turning professional? It was myself and my brother Huey, deceased. Because let's just put it like this. Huey was the building blocks of Tyson's career. Without him, there'd be no Tyson. And there were years there when you weren't around, John. Yeah. You, you, you weren't, you were, you were convicted of a crime. Yep. And you went to prison. I did. So you missed some big years. I did. And at a time, really, when he needed me, there was no one there to, like, steer the ship anymore. But my brother had done a good job, my brother Huey. And, yeah, took him to 17 or 18 pro wins, British and Commonwealth title. You know, done really well with him. Out of a tin shed, no facilities. Just knowledge and a pure love of boxing. Whilst I was inside, yeah. I thought, I'm in prison. I'll just carry on. I'll eat what's put in front of me, do as I'm told and get through it. There's five and a half years to do, I'll do it. When it come to getting released, I was sort of like nervous, like I didn't want to go anywhere. I, was, I, was, I think I got semi-institutionalised, to be honest with you. It's a funny thing to say, but I think I was semi-institutionalised and I was getting that way where I was comfortable. You know, I thought, I kept saying to myself, you know what, if I get out, I get out. You know, I was, get, I was having these phone calls, it was all like small talk, there was no sincere stuff anymore. And I felt like a stranger with my own family. You know, and that went on for a long time. And once you were released, what was your relationship like with your family, your two sets of family? It was difficult, you know, because I'd been gone that long, I sort of didn't fit. I was sort of thought of like, a, I felt like I was a bit of a nuisance. You know, I was trying to get my point across and nobody was listening to me. And I thought even one time, I thought I was back, better off back in jail because the respect thing wasn't there anymore. You know, it was hard to fit back in. And I thought, they're looking at me as just an ex-convict with no brains now. You know, is my life ever going to be the same again? I needed help to adjust myself, and I'm trying to help others. But I was the one who needed to help me. And it's at that time, John, as you're coming to terms with your position and, and where you are in life, that was at the time when Tyson was having some real problems. Tyson was very good at hiding stuff. But I'm his dad, blood's thicker than water. And when you bred somebody, you know him inside out. And I was putting my own situation on one side and I was looking at him and I thought, this boy ain't right, something's wrong. And we used to cover bits of walks while he was in camp. And we used to get to know each other again, walking and talking. And he used to say to me, you know what, Dad, for the first 15 years of my life, I thought you was an absolute, well, I won't say because it's television, but you don't know what I mean. I said, that's a fair comment, I probably was. But I said, that's then, now's now. I can't change the past we can change the present and the future. And if we want to go forward, we've got to leave that in the past and let's move on from where we are today. You've got issues, explain your case. When it just went on, he was telling me bizarre stuff and he was blowing my mind. And when I was vulnerable myself, I thought, my God, it's overloading my fuse boxes. I'm going to blow a fuse myself here. But I thought, stand your ground, listen, be a strong father, be a rock, hear him out, let's see, and take it step by step. When I realised then, within half an hour, how unwell he really was. It was terrible for me and him. Tyson Fury seemed to just change with each fight. He really struggled as a pro, and we found out why, because he'd been drinking. We know there was an awful lot of conflict in his life at that time. No one could really pull him on track, but then we kept seeing glimpses of what he could do. Then we had the, the big night in Germany with Vladimir Klitschko. Leading up to the Klitschko fight, Inspiring, he was laying down after three rounds and crying his eyes out. I said, right, you're not boxing. He said, look, Dad, I've got problems. Yes, I know I have. But, he said, I'll never get this chance again. I've worked my whole life to get to this position I'm here today. So I'm going to take it with both hands. Yes, I'm mentally unwell. Have I trained hard? Yes. I've had a good camp? Yes. Let's put my mental stress to one side and let me become the fighting man I am. I seen that light in my son's eye. I know him inside out. I knew he was going to take Vladimir Klitschko. Was that one of the, if not the happiest hour of your life, John? Absolutely, yeah. Nobody gave him a, a prayer, really. And he did the impossible. That, for me, will never be equaled. Even the Deontay Wilder too. Great, but I knew that was going to happen. And Fury launches himself forward here. He'll leave everything in the ring tonight because you get the 
distinct impression. The fury is landing a will at times. Two left hooks, a big left uppercut. Klitschko takes them well, but fury takes control. The last 20 seconds, they come together in centre ring. The two men are exhausted. They're throwing here only on willpower. They're swinging Wild West style right to the end. Bedlam in the ring here in Dusseldorf as Tyson Fury makes history. He becomes the first from a gypsy traveller's background to win one of the most coveted prizes in sport. The self-styled Gypsy King is the heavyweight champion of the world. But he also said out there in Germany after that fight, this might be it. It might not get better than this. And we thought he was talking rubbish. But then, of course, the next 18 months, two years, they were particularly difficult. Absolutely, Steve, because instead of it going forward and going to bigger and better things, which I know we couldn't get any bigger or better because it was the undisputed championship of the world and it got all the belts. But when we got back, there was no open-top buses, no paparazzi, no pats on the back, no big crowds. And he said to me, I've trained all my life for this. He said, I won a world title, it's like it's never happened. I said, you know what, Tyson, it's happened because we was there and I'm your dad. And uh, nobody could be more proud of you than I am today. So I said, don't worry about other people. The right people are here and it's what matters to us. You've won, other people, they'll come round to the shock of it eventually. You know, but as we got home, 40 hours later, they took the, uh, I think it was the IBF belt. First one to strip. The first one to strip. He said, he said, I fought my guts out in a foreign land to win these belts for a super champion. Now they've took this belt and made it vacant. He just couldn't handle that. He was depressed before he went into the Klitschko fight. And that just sent him to another level. Down. Deep. As deep as you could go. And almost cost him his life. Without my mental health sufferer, I've been like it since I've been born. I'd even have a good day at work and I'd still be depressed and I'm thinking, you know what, why do I feel like this? I've got a home, I've got my health and strength, I've got a family, why am I depressed today? But it was mental health. It's a DNA thing, it's hereditary, we know that now. When I seen how Tyson was behaving, I had enough sense to consult the professionals. I knew I had to get them on board if we was to go forward with my son's health, his life and his career. Without those people, there would be no Tyson. He probably would have killed himself. Forget coronavirus, it's a pandemic on its own mental health, more serious than ever. The last couple of years, you've been spending a lot of time with one of your other fighting sons, Tommy, in a very different situation. Absolutely, Steve, yeah, absolutely, uh, two different people. But I've seen a lot of joy in your face working with Tommy. Yeah, well, you know, Tommy's something that I put together, I've done myself. Nobody else has ever trained him except me. You know, he had a brief stint with my brother when I was in prison, you know, and I thank him very much for that. But when I come out, Tommy'd always want to be with me. He knows mm. I've got his best interest at heart and I will do anything I can to make him succeed and go to the top. We've both put in a lot of hard work over the years to get where we are. My dad is a great father, a great person, a stand-on man. I wouldn't be here today without my dad. I wonder, and this is an odd question, but I know you'll answer it because yeah. in the spirit of it, I wonder what your family member, your old mentor, Bartley Gorman, would make of Love Island and Tommy Fury <laughs> going on it. He'd had a few choice words, I know, Bartley, but you know what? He'd have commended Tommy, you know. He'd have been insane over Tyson. He'd have been moved in Tyson's back garden. He'd have had his open lot, gypsy boat up in his back garden, telling him everything. He'd have been welded to Tyson, more so than me. However close I am to Tyson, he'd have been closer because Bartley loved his boxing, he loved his fighting. He was a fighting man. And it's sad for me that none of these great people are around anymore to see all this. And I feel sort of like sad, really, because I think I'm seeing all of this and all those great people would have loved it with me and not here to share it with me. And that's my downside of everything. When I'm alone at night, I think Bartley, Sam, Huey Burton, all them Oathy Burton, all great fighting men, are not here to witness what's gone on here. And they're all family, you know, so it does bother me. But listen, what can we do? You've only got a, a short lifespan on this, I'm afraid, and it goes quickly.
Life's a gift and it's what, up to you what you do with it. From being born to dying, what you do in the middle is totally down to you, no one else. And I've tried to do the best I can, be a good father, so my kids could look up to me and say, my dad's a strong man, I want to be like my dad, I admire my dad, they trust me as a father. My dad's been an inspiration, he's, um, he's always helped me in my boxing, always supported me. And he's a, he's a man. He's a man of all. He's a man of all men in my eyes. He inspired me to become a boxer. You know, I always wanted to be like my dad. He was a professional boxer, um, so he inspired me to become a boxer as well. You know, what more can you ask for? If your kids trust you wholeheartedly, you've won, haven't you? Because they can depend on me. And I'm very proud of every one of them. I'm a lucky man. Six.